Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Olivia Haynes, and I am the co-director of the Ruben Mark Initiative for Organizational Character and Leadership here at Columbia Business School. And I'm thrilled to be welcoming you all to this author talk with Adam Bryant, focusing on crucial lessons from his new book, The Leap to Leader, How Ambitious Managers Make the Jump to Leadership. Based upon insights from more than 100 successful leaders, Adam will give us an insider's view into the book, helping us, helping us unpack the practical strategies and advice he shares which can help you broaden your impact and lead others effectively as you move up in your career. We're so excited for this session as Adam Bryan is a well-respected and noted expert on executive leadership. Prior to his current role as Senior Managing Director of the Exco Group, which is a leadership development and executive coaching firm for Fortune 500 companies, he was a journalist for over 30 years, including 18 at the New York Times as the founding author of The Corner Office. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, he is the author of three previous books, with his first book being a New York Times bestseller. And most notably, he is a longtime friend of the Ruben Mark Initiative at Columbia's Business School, serving as our senior advisor. Adam will start us off with a quick primer and preview of the book, and then we will launch right into moderated Q&A, where we are most interested in hearing from you, so please have your questions ready. And just a quick housekeeping note, uh, we would love for you to sign in, so make sure that you uh, put your John Hancock on our sign-in sheet. So with that, I'm very excited to have Adam Bryan get us started for today. Thank you right. so much. Thanks so much. <laughs> First of all, thank you for coming. I know you guys are busy. Um, I'm going to be ambitious for the 45 minutes we spend together. Can I just get a quick show of hands? How many of you have management experience in your professional career? Hands way up so I can see. Quite a few of you. OK, second question. Of those who have management experience, how many of you enjoy managing people? Great. Pretty good percentage. How many of you in your careers want to move into leadership positions? Does anybody not want to, is, and this, this is a no judgment question. Does anybody dream of going through a very successful career and not having a single person report to them? All right, this is great. Just want to get a sense of the room. Um, so I'm going to give you just a quick bit of context. Um, Olivia mentioned the corner office series I created. So I got into the leadership space about a dozen years ago with this weekly interview series. I created at, at the New York Times. Um, it was based on a very simple what if, which is what if I sat down with CEOs and never asked them a single question about their companies, and instead asked them about key leadership lessons they've learned over the course of their lives, um, how they think about kind of the universal challenges of leadership, T culture, teams, how they hire. Um, so I did this for a decade, interviewed more than 525 CEOs. As you can see from the faces there, I, from the very start, I tried to embrace diversity in every sense of the word, race, gender, nationality, for-profit, not-for-profit, different industries, different size companies. Um, I left the Times about six years ago to join my current firm. Our core business is one-on-one -on -one mentoring at the, at the C-suite level. We work a lot with leadership teams, with boards on succession and things. Since leaving the Times, I've gone all in on LinkedIn, where I've got four different interview series, um, staying in the sort of swim lane of we're just going to talk about leadership. We're not going to talk about strategy. So interview series with CEOs, heads of HR, board directors. Um, and after the murder of George Floyd, we started a series called Leading in the B-Suite. And I say we, because my partner on that is a woman named Rhonda Morris, who's the head of HR at Chevron. Um, it's been a fascinating time to be doing these interviews over the last few years because just, you know, I, this has been so much disruption. Everybody's trying to figure everything out. Um, so please, I urge you to subscribe just because I publish these pretty regularly. And there's just, it's not about me, it's just about the great insights that you're going to hear from these leaders. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like compound interest. You start out interviewing a lot of CEOs and keep at it, and suddenly you find yourself passing the 1,000 interview milestone. Um, and I never set out to write books. It's just you start interviewing CEOs, and interesting patterns emerge. Um, and then interesting questions start emerging. And under each of those books is kind of an underlying question. And the CEO test is more, the way I think about it is that's it really tried to unpack what are the core things that leaders do? But if you had to narrow the list and say, what are the challenges that make or break all leaders, not just CEOs? 
but what can we then learn from CEOs about how to handle those challenges well? So the post-it note on the CEO test book is what do leaders do and how do you do it well? My last book is really more about how you need to be as a leader. So what is the mindset shift you have to make to become a leader? And that's really what I want to explore in this book. Um, it's a bit of an unconventional approach. Rather than having seven or 12 chapters, it's really four sections. It's sort of how it broke down naturally for me. Um, and just in the short time I'm going to be talking to you before we get to questions and things like that, to me at the core of it, like especially for you folks where you are at your the stage in your career, I want to share with you three questions that I think would be good for you to spend some time answering for yourself. I think it's good to get this clear in your own mind what the difference is. And you ask pretty much anybody, and everybody's got sort of their own definition of it. But I think there's a lot of a lot of differences between managing and leading. So I'm going to share with you two slides. And as I'm, I put these up, like, really think about what resonates for you personally. The third one really jumps out at me because I just I think we're in this era where every company is like trying to figure it out, right? So the, prior to the pandemic, I really feel like this century started in like 2020. Prior to the pandemic, it was just a lot of decades where everything about business was sort of optimizing and making more things more efficient. The world was a little more predictable. You know, six sig six sigma lean manufacturing. But the world is different now, and, and people don't have the playbooks. And so it's really a leader's job and the mindset. And I feel like it doesn't matter what your title is, where you are in an organization. Everybody can lead from their seat. And the mindset to me is like, I'm going to write this playbook. Even if somebody hands me sort of expected outcomes, I'm going to figure out how to transform this job, make it more efficient, and then buy myself some time to look around and see what else I can do here. Second to last one really jumps out for me because I've, I've worked for a lot of bosses in my career, and, and I feel like you can put all bosses in one of two camps. There are those who are more self-centered, and the people on their teams, they just see them as kind of assets to help them achieve their own goals. And there are others who are more selfless, Right, who do have this attitude like, how can I help you? I, I see potential for you. I want to help you achieve things that maybe you didn't believe you could. And it's not like it's black or white or two ends of the extreme. Everybody's a little bit of a mix of both. But I just feel like we can all feel it in, in our guts when we're working for somebody who's a little more self-centered. So just be clear in your mind that it is not about you. And that's one of the, to me, the paradoxes of leadership, that as you move up, all the signals you are getting that is that it is about you. Like people are studying you and you have this outsized impact, whatever you do. But that leadership is not about you. It's about the organization and helping other people. Here's the second question that I'd like you to spend some time wrestling with. There's a reason why the word really is italicized here. You really want to do this? I always encourage people, invest as much time as you can talking to people who are in the kind of roles that you aspire to get to. So that you are crystal clear as much as you possibly can be about what you are stepping into. 
because one of the most common things that plays out is people say, yeah, I want that job. And then they get the job and it's like, I had no idea. There's a ton more work to do. I can't do work at work because I'm spending all my day putting out fires and dealing with people problems. Right? And people spend so much time now when they graduate from high school college tours. Right? You've got to go visit 10 colleges and be going along and say, how do you feel about how you feel? It's like, does this feel like a good, we do so much research about picking the right college or university. And a lot of people don't do that when they say they want that bigger, they're like, I want that bigger job. You talk to enough CEOs like I do, and you know, some of them will tell you like everybody wants the CEO job until they become the CEO. So do as much work as you can to find out what these jobs are like. there are a couple of powerful forces or rivers, if you will, that sort of carry people along into these bigger jobs. And one of them is from the corporate side, as Shauna describes here, because the way it works in a lot of companies is they start looking at their leadership pi pipeline, identifying the high potentials. You start putting faces on slides. It's like, okay, these are all the people that we see as our next generation of leaders. We're going to invest in them. We're going to broaden their experience. We're going to promote them. And as Shauna says, nobody ever stops to ask, do you actually want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? And the other force that carries people along are frankly just like the status hits that we get in our society. Like all the social signals are, get that bigger job. Get the bigger title. Keep moving up. Might get a bigger office if you actually have an office. Right? More pay, more status. And a lot of people are carried along by that. And you just have to be aware of those key forces. And again, what I always try and do with leadership is I try to start conversations, not end conversations. And I want, my goal here is for you to start a conversation with yourself. And be really clear about what you want to do and why you want to do it so that you're not surprised about what you're stepping into. And that it is okay to say no. I mean, I've had enough different jobs that I've, I've led teams. I've been the number one on teams. But I have also turned down two promotions in my career. And I got a lot of funny looks when I said, I don't want that job. But for about two years, I sat three feet from the person who was doing the job they wanted me to do. And I knew exactly what that job was. And I knew that I wasn't good at a lot of the stuff that he was doing. And I didn't want to do a lot of the stuff that he was doing. These last few years have been kind of a make or break for a lot of people. One of the things that we see in our work is that people who were headed for the C-suite, some people are just saying, I'm out. Because we can argue about the number, but leadership is a lot harder now than it used to be. It's not just about driving performance, building the organization anymore. There's all these other components, all these other conversations and challenges for leaders that we're all still figuring it out. And for some people, that feels overwhelming. But some people are really wired. They're excited about this. You have to ask yourself, what kind of person are you? Because being a leader right now feels like every day somebody's handing you a brand new Rubik's Cube. Some new problem you've never seen before. And by the way, as soon as you solve that, there's basically a huge pile outside your office of other Rubik's Cubes that you have to solve that you have never seen before, that are tough decisions, there's no right answer. You have to ask yourself, does that sound exciting? What a breathtaking time of history that we're living through. Like the world was pretty stable for a long time, but everything about the world of work is changing right now. Leadership, relationship between employers and employees. You have an opportunity to shape the future of work and leadership. Is that exciting? Or does that pile of Rubik's Cubes feel like it's going to feel like kryptonite to you?
begin. Start that conversation with yourself. You really want to do it and be clear about why. So the third question that I want you to wrestle with is this one. Most of you are still early in your careers and you may not have an answer right away for this, but I think it's important for you to start thinking about how you would answer this question. Because I, I feel like people are moving up in their careers. You're always taught to have your elevator pitch ready. Right? I've got to be elevated. And elevator pitch usually means one of two things. If you're on an elevator with a CEO, they might turn to you and say, so what are you working on? Elevator pitch one. Elevator pitch two. So what do you want to do here? Like, what are your career goals? What next job do you want? You've got to have that elevator pitch ready. But in our work with senior leaders, what I've realized is that people generally don't prepare a third elevator pitch, which is just imagine for yourself, just for a second, You've taken over a new team, getting to know people, sharing a bit about yourself, strategies, things like that. What would you say if somebody says, I'm just curious, like, who are you as a leader? What would you say? And I don't expect you to have the answer right away, but I think it's a good question for you to think about and invest time, because it gets at you know, important qualities of self-awareness. The vast majority of the interviews that I've done in person, you know, I, I just find that there's this look that I see in a lot of CEOs' eyes. It's just sort of one, it's calm, it's confident. They seem comfortable in their own skin. People talk about this quality of executive presence, gravitas, like what does that mean? And I think a big part of that is just like, ask me anything. So again, start the conversation. It takes a lot of time. I put myself through this exercise, and I set aside a very long car ride by myself without the radio or music on. Predictability is, to me, one of those qualities of leadership that people don't talk about enough. It's not predictable, like I know exactly what you're going to say, but it's about your behavior. Like, are you predictable? Because if you are in the best sense of the word, then people don't have to spend their energy figuring you out. I got you. It's not like you're going to walk into work and like your mood's going to be different every day. Because then they can focus on the work. I have worked for people where every day I would spend time watching them come in. Like, what mood are you in today? It's an enormous energy drain. It's stressful, and it takes your eye off the ball. So you want to be predictable. So I think there's a natural question. So how do you answer the question about who are you as a leader? I'm not going to tell you what your answers are, but I'm, I am going to suggest a framework for how to think about what a good answer sounds like. And it starts with being clear about what the sort of currencies of leadership are. Like, how do you talk about yourself as a leader in a meaningful way? And just having done what I've done for a long time, I respectfully submit that these are the three currencies of leadership. An insight, tell me something that makes me feel smarter about human behavior, about organizations, whatever it is, about leadership. Some universally applicable insight. I learned this. And the second one is, how did you learn it? Tell the story. Make it real. Because a lot of people say a lot of things but the story is kind of the reality check. You can say, this is really important to me, and there's an implicit, oh yeah, like prove it. And then you tell a story. It's like, well, when I was a kid, this happened to me. 
and it was really tough, and you get through it, and then people go, okay, I believe you now. And again, we're wired as human beings to share stories and remember things through stories. And the final thing is the sort of the top spin. I learned this, this is how I learned it, and because of that, this is how I added that to my leadership approach, my leadership philosophy, my leadership toolkit. Somebody needs to say, hey, Adam, what does that look like in action? Hey, Adam, what does that look like in Thank you. That's, that's <laughs> great. Appreciate the prompt. Um, so I, I want to show you just a few quick examples um, from all the interviews that I've done over the years that to me are good examples of this. And again, just keep this in mind. Pam is one of our mentors here. She spoke, what was it, about a year ago here? Obviously, this is a condensed version, but in this, you've got the insight. She learned about the importance of telling the truth. She told you a painful story about how she learned it, right? And then what did she do with that? So as a leader, because of that painful lesson she learned, she wants to create an environment where people feel comfortable telling her the truth. So she says, I've got your back, I'll take the bullets. First of all, anybody work for a boss like that? <laughs> right, he's pretty open about it. Tells you the story. But it was a clear lesson he learned. And so what did he do with that? You can see the arc. I learned this lesson, this is how I learned it, and so this is, this is how that affected my leadership approach. What did he do with that? He tells his team, everybody has to get 15% better every year. Now, there's obvious questions like, how do you measure that? You can't measure it. I also got to say, I love the specificity of it, like 15%, right? not 10, it's not 20, 15. Um, but the point is it sends a signal. Right? We've all got to be getting better. Like status quo isn't good enough anymore. And this really resonates for me personally because I've managed hundreds of reporters over my career as a journalist. And I can flex to almost anybody. I can accommodate all manner of quirks. But if the person I'm working with doesn't want to get better at their job, it's just not going to be a great relationship. So this one really resonated for me. So again, those are three examples. You can see the arc in each. And this is the slide that I share with you know, a lot of the leaders that we work with to help them start thinking about how they would answer that question, who are you as a leader? Stuff in bold at the top is the key question, right? Questions underneath are how you think about it, right? They get at the stories, and then what did you do with them? So what I would encourage you all to do, again, start the conversation with yourself. I would encourage everybody to just take a picture of this slide, keep it on your phone, and just over the years occasionally go back to it. Because your answer is going to emerge over time through experiences. Most of you are still kind of early stages in your career. That story is going to evolve. Who are you as a leader? But just know that if you invest the time in it, it's going to help with your self-awareness. And just, you may go through your entire career. Nobody will ever ask you, who are you as a leader? But what if they did? Right? 
What a great position to be in. Well, without missing a beat, you say, you know, I really appreciate that question. These are the three things that really matter to me. And this is why they matter to me. This is how they became important to me. And this is how they sort of show up in my leadership approach. Without missing a beat. That's a leadership moment. So with that, hope that was helpful. Get to some Q&A. We'd love to hear some questions for you. I think Olivia's going to grill me a bit here. <laughs> I know she's been looking forward to this. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much. Yes. So, just fun stuff here. Okay. Um, so I know Adam very well, so this is actually a really, really um, exciting engagement for me. But I am just going to get us started with a few questions, and then really we're going to turn it over to you quickly. So I think one of the first questions I would want to ask is, obviously you're a prolific author on leadership. Why? Why are you so passionate about writing about leadership? Um, a few reasons. One, I think leadership is one of the hardest, if not the hardest things to do on the planet. There's just so many subtleties and nuances to me. It's just kind of this endless puzzle, and it's why I keep, I've interviewed more than a thousand leaders and just keep hearing great insights and s stories, and I, I want to share those. Um, I interviewed a CEO once who said he liked people who are information socialists, uh, which means that if you learn something, you want to share it with other people rather than hoard that information. And so, um, I guess I'm an information socialist, and I'm from Canada originally, so like the socialist thing all comes and makes sense. Um, um, but secondly, I would say if you gave me a really big magic wand, I'd get rid of three things, um, inequality, racism, and bad bosses, um, because I think there are far too many bosses in the world still. I'm optimistic that will change over time because your generation is less tolerant of a bad user experience from a boss. Uh, but there are just still way too many bad bosses in the world. And the final thing is that if, if I feel like if I can, you know, leadership has such an exponential impact, right, good or bad. Like a good leader just can sort of lift an entire organization and all the people they work there. It's just communities around them. And bad leaders, and we've just seen it over and over, can tear down organizations and just create a lot of toxic stress for people. So if I can make a very small contribution at the margins to help people become better leaders, that's a good day. Perfect. And that's what we're trying to do through the Ruben Mark Initiative here, is to drive the importance on leadership skills yep. that help impart exceptional organizational cultures, because it retains employees. It keeps people engaged, and it makes them happy. Yeah. And, and I, the final reason I will share, too, is I first became a manager when I was 27. I was working at a medium-sized daily newspaper, um, and my boss became the managing editor. He was the business editor, and he said, you're going to be the new business editor. And I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. Um, so I was 27. I was managing a staff of seven. Two of them were old enough to be my father and wanted the job that he gave me. Um, and I just remember those years, like, I made every mistake in the book. I think I invented a few, but it was just like, it's like, wow, this is hard. This is really hard. Um, so that started my, like, like how to, t almost teaching myself. And then I wasn't a manager for a long time, like, number of years. Um, I went to the New York Times as a reporter. I went to New Newsweek Magazine as a senior writer and the sort of, I, didn't, I never wanted to manage anybody again, to be honest, but um, I got tired of working for really bad bosses. And the business editor at, the, at Newsweek left, um, and all my colleagues were coming to me anyways to talk about their stories and things like that. So when the business editor left, they said, you've got to become the business editor. And my, my tolerance for bad bosses had kind of run out, so... I became a manager for about 15 years at Newsweek and then at the Times and learned a whole bunch of new lessons. So. <laughs> well, one of the big lessons in the book up front um, was actually stated by Mary Elizabeth Pere, who was a senior executive at EY, and she said in her leap to leadership, she had to figure out what to let go of in order to make the leap. Yeah. You're speaking to a room of mostly type A uh, students who may have a hard time with this concept, but it's a <laughs> critical one interwoven throughout the entire book. Can you help us unpack what it means to let go in a tact tactful way yep. and one that doesn't drive someone who seeks control crazy? Yeah, yep, of course. 
And a lot of it goes back to this idea of, you know, what got you there won't get you to the next level, right? Or what got you here won't get you there. So you be, all of you in this room have your superpowers, right? Every one of you is probably in the top 5% in the world at at least one thing. I'm, I'm going to put $100 down on the bet, that bet. And because of your superpowers, you are going to move up pretty quickly based on those skills, right? And there's going to be a wonderful sort of feedback loop for you. Like you're good at it, a lot of rewards, you do it better and faster than everybody else, and like things come of it. And that becomes like your core skill. But you, you're going to hit a point where to scale yourself as a leader to get to the next level, you're going to have to give away the stuff you really love to do and are really good at. You've just got, it's, it's not just about delegation, it's like doing the internal work to say, as much as I love doing this, I'm not going to be able to scale myself unless I give it to other people. And as the woman I quoted, she says it's also an act of generosity and it helps you build other leaders, but that is a trap that a heck of a lot of people fall into and why they have trouble scaling themselves. You see it a lot with founders of startups, right? Because they may have started, you know, because they were coding wizards, right? And they just can't let go of the engineering. So that's why it's a cliche that startup founders top out at a certain level, right? And they bring in an operating CEO. So, and I always say to people, you don't have to, I'm not saying you have to give away everything you're good at. Because there may be things that you are so good at that are really important to whatever you are doing. I just... I ask you to be aware of that phenomenon. And so that if you decide to hold on and do the stuff that you're really good at, just be aware that you are doing it and be clear in your mind about why and what you should give away and what you shouldn't give away. Thank you for that. Um, so we know from your uh, quick primer of the book, you are very averse to platitudes. Yes. It's one of your... Strong points I knew from day one. Yes. Um, but some would argue that some of the lessons in your book sound all go good and well, but leaders have a tough time following up talk with action. So what would be your biggest piece of advice for those following this line of skepticism? And what is your least favorite leadership platitude? Um, and if, I, if I'm hearing you right, it's... The way, the way I think about what you're asking me is how to be a, conskepti a, a skeptical consumer of leadership. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, so I have been... And walking the talk. Or talk, or yeah. Yes. Action to the talk. Walking talking. the talk, yes. yes. So let me start with the last point. The, one of the biggest problems in leadership, I think, is when people say one thing and their actions say something else, right? And if you've all... You know, for those who worked for some bad bosses, that's often the problem, right? They say one thing, it's like, my door is always open. I, I really want feedback. It's like, they don't want the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> the door is open, just don't go in. <laughs> right? and, and, like, that is a very common problem. Um, and it's particularly important in this era because I feel like employees are, have become much more vocal and much more willing to call out their employers when there is a gap between the walk and the talk. And it's not just sort of like strategy, mission, purpose, values, um, but you just have to make sure that there's no gap between those. That's why, you know, when I was doing Corner Ops, I interviewed some Wall Street CEOs who were almost like caricatures. Like there's one guy in particular who said, this is a pure meritocracy. You work here, nobody will get paid any more than they deserve. Just because if they're a nice person or they're dealing, it's like it doesn't work that way. And what I appreciated about that is like, I think the walk matched the talk. What's really troublesome to me is when people say, oh, our culture is based on all these things. And it's like, okay, that person you just hired is like total contradiction to the values. Right? And we've seen that in movie a lot. And if you hire one jerk, then you've got to, or promote one jerk, you've got a jerky culture. So that's, that's to me, a, a big part of it. In terms of leadership platitudes, so I've been in the leadership space now about 13 years. Um, I've got a highly refined theory about like why roughly 98% of it is hooey. Um, and sorry if I've got an opinion about this, but the, the leadership space is very fun. It's, it's, a, it's a funny space because just about anybody can say anything about leadership. 
and it's going to be true at some level. Right? Like leadership is one of those big words. It's gotten beyond just sort of leading people in the context of business, right? Like they've got leadership camps for five-year-olds, you know what I mean? Like it's just become this sort of how to lead yourself. And so it's just become this word that's, that now means so much more. Um, and so the, the key thing for me is just because something isn't wrong, right? You can say anything about leadership and just leadership is about dot, 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 fill in the blank. Pretty much whatever you say is going to be right at some level. But just because it's not wrong doesn't mean it's an insight. And that's the bar that I hold. Like if somebody's going to share with you something about leadership, do you say to yourself, like, that's an insight. Like, set that bar. Because so many people try to simplify the leadership field, and in doing so, they oversimplify it. So you get a lot of books or headlines on LinkedIn posts like, leadership is about this one thing. It's like, wow, somebody's figured it out. They've cracked the code. It's like, one thing. What is it? <laughs> you know, as you click on it, it's like, it's about communication. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? And so I, I just really encourage all of you to be skeptical consumers of leadership and ask yourself, is this an insight? Is it a new insight to me? Is it an insight I knew, but maybe there's a really timely reminder of it? But just be clear in your mind, like, Set that bar, because there's so much stuff out there. And so much of it is about platitudes and people trying to oversimplify. Like there's a book called The One Thing. And if you go into the book, it's all the, the book is all it's saying is like, figuring out the one thing is really important. It's like, really? That's a book? <laughs> you sold that book? Good for you. <laughs> because people are like desperate for you to simplify this hellishly complicated thing called leadership. Um, and in terms of I, the, the list of platitudes that I have a problem with is probably long, but I do have an opinion that not everybody agrees with. But the term servant leadership has become a little bit of a bugaboo for me. A and bugaboo? Who? I, a bugaboo. You know, it's like a technical <laughs> term. <laughs> um, and again, like, to me, this is like, we can debate this all night long, and I know a lot of people uh, disagree with me around this, but you will, if you haven't heard this a lot already, you are going to hear this a lot. Just like if you were me interviewing a lot of CEOs, people do this dramatic pause and go, you know, Adam, I'm a servant leader. You need to know the context for where that comes from. So the, the phrase came up 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, years ago now, and it felt like a new idea, because at the time, leadership was very much based on sort of militaristic command and control style, right? So along comes this guy, and he writes this paper about servant leadership, and it felt different. Like, what can I do for you? But I think it's become, like, my test is that when somebody puts a word in front of leadership, and that's, that's, that's the thing to look out for, right? Because a lot of people try and sort of popularize or come up with a new idea of leadership, and they put a new word in front of leadership, servant leadership. There's a book called Positive Leadership. And people are doing this all the time. And the, the question that you always have to put at the end of that is as opposed to what? Or somebody says to me, like, I'm a certain le servant leader, and I want to ask them, as opposed to what? Like, haven't you heard that Bob Dylan song? Like, we all serve somebody. Like, you serve, you got a boss, you got board of directors, the board of directors have a boss, the investors. Telling me you are a servant leader doesn't tell me anything. Because what does that mean exactly? Not that I have an opinion about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to open it up to student questions, because um, I'm sure that we have a few more. Um, and I have a few questions as well. OK, we'll go right here. Thank you so much uh, for sharing those great insights. I just have one question. You uh, talked about your experience at 27 where you were leading so many people. So if you know now, if, sorry, if you knew then what you know now, uh, what would you have done differently? Yeah. So my father was a journalist as well, um, an editor for many years. And he may have said this to me at a younger age, but I didn't really <coughs> hear it and didn't appreciate it. But he shared with me an insight that somebody shared with him, which is 
edit the person, not the words. And what that meant was focus on the person and making them better at what they do rather than focusing on your energies on like fixing the work or editing the work. And to me, it's a metaphor for something bigger, which is like you have to meet people where they are and, and, and try and figure out how to help them get better. Um, and it took me a while to figure that out. I think when I was younger, I was sort of very much focused on like the quality, the words, you know, the work product. I wanted to make sure that it was everything was as good as you know what I was producing as a reporter. And that's a pretty predictable pattern for first managers, first time managers. And so I was a cliche um, as a young manager. But just the the longer I did, I I really felt like my role um, was a coach. I, I sometimes think the world would be better off they got rid of the word manager, because manager, there's a close cousin to that called micromanaging, and like a lot of people don't want to be managed. I once had a reporter say to me, I feel like you're managing me. <laughs> <laughs> I am, because you're not managing yourself well. <laughs> um, and I just think if, if, if we put a different label on it and called it coaching, like that's what managers do and should do. And that's how I saw my job. I wanted to help people get better. And that's why I had such a problem with people who didn't want to get better. Because it's like, man, like you, it is such an honor and responsibility to be a journalist at the New York Times. And the fact that you don't want to get better at your job, like to me, that's just a deal breaker. So I, I would sometimes actively manage myself to like get away from working with those people. I really had a hard time with it. Yeah, thanks so much for coming, Adam. Um, so my question is, like, when the selection committee or board is evaluating, like, you know, CEO options, how do they weight like subject matter expertise or domain knowledge versus ability to manage others? Yeah, and it's and, and we interviewed a lot of directors and asked them a version of that question, and and a lot of them start their answer by saying we're we're taking sort of expertise at like domain expertise as almost a given. And what they're looking for is like the leadership qualities. Can they influence others? Can they inspire people, get them to follow them? Do they know how to you know, communicate? Um, do they seem, you know, one of the trickiest part of the last few years is that people, leaders are being told like all these words, humanity, authenticity, vulnerability, transparency. Those are big words. Like we could spend a lot of time unpacking what those mean, but those are the things that people want from their leaders now. Um, not, it's not just about running the business anymore. Um, thank you for being here. When you were... Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> when you were talking about the difference between managing and leading and, and had those the list of things up there, something that resonated with me was kind of like creating the world you wanted to see or looking around you and thinking about how to make it better. But I have run into roadblocks with that when my management were exhibiting some of the negative behaviors that you talked about. Yep. So as people about to enter kind of like a middle manager position, how can you be a leader within that, especially if the people above you are not necessarily creating a positive environment? Yeah, it's and, and I appreciate the question. And it is a very common phenomenon, right? Because as you go through your career, you may have a mindset where you want to do new things and you see opportunities and you're willing to raise your hand to do more. Um, and a lot of organizations just aren't built that way. Like people want to keep you in the box, right? There's a job description and we just want you to do that. Um, and I've, I've felt some of that friction myself, of, especially when I, because when I did Corner Office of the New York Times, that was a side project for me in addition to my day job, managing teams of reporters. And, you know, so I, I know what it's like to feel that it's like, hey, you've got, just, got, just do your core job. Like, but just like, can you just do your job? And you, I can't give you a template for how to navigate that decision because at some point that friction, that sort of feeling boxed in is going to become so strong that you might decide to leave or move to a different part of it. Um, but you know, none of those decisions should be taken lightly to state the obvious. And there's a, a section in the book, and thank you for buying the books, by the way. Um, but there's a whole section in the book about like 
when should you stay in your job and when should you leave? And again, it's not a black and white answer, but there's some great insights from some leaders I've interviewed about how to think through that. Like, how long do you put up with a bad boss before you leave, right? Just like, these are the kind of questions you, unfortunately, you're gonna have to wrestle with. We're gonna take two more questions, one over there, and then you were over there. Oh. If you two are quick, I'll get both of you in. You, you mentioned, you, you mentioned failure or, or mistakes that you'd made, but my question is more about like irredeemable failure and how you or people you've talked to have sort of come back from those moments of making something where they you know, made such a big error that they had to basically step out of that leadership role and then how did they find their way back? And to be fair, just add one more beat to the question so that I'm, I'm clear, like in terms of CEOs that I've seen go through that or... Yeah, yeah, either yourself have gone through it or if you've seen, you've seen yeah. it or how, or how they've thought about and dealt with that sort of level of failure. Right. And if they return, how they return, how they, how they grew. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the, the key step is to own it, um, which a lot of people aren't necessarily willing to do. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of stories from CEOs who, you know, at some point in their career made a really bad bet or something, and they just, they went to the board and they said, look, this is what I thought. This is what I didn't account for. The bet has turned horribly wrong. We're going to have to write off $200 million. And, you know, I want you to know that. And the board would say, look, just the reaction, we appreciate you owning it. And you've obviously learned a lot from this experience. Um, and so we want to keep you in the job. And to me, that's the break point that I see for a lot of people. It's like, we're, everybody makes mistakes. So you guys are going to have some, like, blunders in your careers. And, you know, I like there are some cultures that work on finger pointing and it's like the last thing you want to do is acknowledge you made a mistake and there are some cultures like that and that's really unfortunate you're gonna to have to read the room about what kind of culture you're in but I just don't think you can go wrong by like owning it um, and I think people are much more willing to give you a break if there's that if you show that vulnerability look I messed up this is what I learned from it it's not gonna happen again and people go, okay, because it's like, we all make mistakes, right? And, and vulnerability is a very, to me, it's like a close cousin of trust, and it's a big part of building that. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And then last two questions over here. And actually, if you can just say, it, say the questions both at the same time, that'd be great, because we're low on time. Hi, so much for being here. Um, thank you. Um, so my question was about um, leadership in an increasingly diverse environment. So um, what have you found different about leaders who come from international backgrounds in the U.S., for example, Indians or um, women of color, etc.? cetera? Um, and how, what is an additional burden on the leader to manage this increasing level of diversity? Yeah, yeah. You guys are good through dinner, right? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> oh, we're going to get yes, okay, one more question okay, in, sure. and then right. yeah, we're low on time. And my question is very similar to hers, and like spe specifically more like male versus female leaders. And I think perception is a big part of leadership. And do you think female leaders tend to be a little bit more aware of how they're perceived, or do they even need to be more aware of how they're perceived than a typical male leader? Um, let's start with the last question. Yes, I think they're. I think. Women and people of color face a lot more headwinds in work than white men. Um, and as much as I wish that, that those headwinds were going to go away, I think they're always going to be there. Um, in terms of differences between male and female leaders, I ask myself that question often when I started interviewing leaders. But I reached a point where I realized, like, there is no, I don't see any patterns, right? I've, I've uh, met for and, and worked for some female leaders who seem to have very low EQ, right? <laughs> Lack of self-awareness. And I've met guys who had like amazing, so like all the sort of, you know, generalizations that may, people make about the difference between men and women, I just haven't seen it. Like there's just been the, too many outliers to sort of, to kind of bust the generalizations. Um, in terms of leading in this environment where, you know, everybody is saying for all the right reasons, diversity, equity, inclusion matter a lot, I think that, creates an additional leadership challenge, and it's a good challenge. Um, but I think it is one of the reasons why leadership 
has become somewhere between five and ten times harder because at the end of the day, the reason why leadership is so hard is because leadership is a series of contradictions. It's a series of paradoxes. It is a series of balancing acts. So you're going to be told as a leader you have to be patient to bring people along, but you've got to create a sense of urgency. right? You've got to be compassionate, but you've got to hold people accountable. Everything that is hard about leadership is a paradox. It is a contradiction. It is a balancing act. And I think that one of the, one of the paradoxes that leaders are dealing with right now is that on the one hand, for all the right reasons, they're being told you have to create an inclusive culture, right? Where everybody feels heard and everybody has a sense of belonging. And yet at the same time, with all the broader issues in society that companies are now supposed to engage on and have an opinion of on, how do you create a culture that is both inclusive and distinctive? Because as a leader, you have to say, look, this is our culture, this is what we stand for, this is what we believe in, this is why we believe in it, and this is what we're putting resources against that. Well, what if somebody disagrees with that, and they're supposed to feel included and have a sense of belonging? Like, these are some of the challenges that they're facing. But, you know, I, I do feel, sort of final point, like, after George Floyd, there's just this hundreds and hundreds of co companies made these commitments. Um, and my sense, my sense is that the interest and commitment to that is fading. Um, I mean, we were at a <laughs> symposium, what was it, earlier this year? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and um, I was one of six white people in the audience, I think, and a lot of people giving reports on the state of DEI in this country, and it was kind of a downer. Um, and the way I think about it is that leaders engage on the topic of DEI, like either through their head or their heart. And I think the ones who do in their head, like the head's a crowded space, right? Maybe they're doing things because they should, because they need to. And at a time, it was part of that should and need to. And now I feel like other things. And it's like, okay, we did that. But it's the leaders who believe it here that are the ones who are really committed to it. And usually when you talk to them about it, there's a story under, underneath that, right? Maybe they're a white male, but they you know, adopted a couple of kids. And one of them was Asian or something. And they saw firsthand how their two kids were treated differently or something. But it's usually those stories that it's like here, and those are the ones who are really committed to it. Um, I don't know if I directly answer your question, but I hope that was helpful. Um, so we are way over time. I apologize profusely, but I think it's because this conversation was so honest, real, and um, really, it, I learned a lot. So um, we just wanted to quickly, before we wrap, um, actually highlight one particular, particularly yes. important person who's featured in this book, um, our benefactor of this initiative, Ruben Mark, who spent his whole career at the Colgate-Palmolive Company working his way up from junior marketing executive all the way to CEO and chairman. Um, and he held that position for close to two decades. So he is a visionary leader who has a really important emphasis on why leadership matters for organizational culture and character. So we wanted to highlight this quote in the book, that there's no question that, that his quote in the book, excuse me, there's no question that you're being studied at every moment. It's the little things that matter. As a leader, you have to role model the behaviors you expect from others every day. So we wanted to end on that note because our initiative um, seeks to show that leadership is a lifelong journey um, and one that you need to participate in, uh, in on every day. So Adam Bryan's book, which you can see, I love this book. Um, I use it every day. Um, is a perfect resource for you to help you practice your leadership. So thank you for joining us. Um, join us for more upcoming workshops to the Leadership Development Series and Wall of Leadership Series. But Adam, thank you so much. For